From Permanent Record Studios in Austin, Texas, this is CreatePod, a podcast about the art of podcasting. Welcome to the first episode of CreatePod. I'm Mike Moody. And I'm Grant Davis. Grant, our guest today is John Rubio. And John just might have the best job in the world. What is he, like a, a puppy wrangler? Or like maybe a candy tester? <laughs> a sex machine? It, Wait, hold on. <laughs> I don't know about a sex machine. Okay. That could go two ways. John might have the the fourth best job in the world after <laughs> after a sex machine. Uh, John is a host, producer, and creator of the Beerus podcast. And essentially his job is to sit in front of a microphone and drink a shit ton of free beer. Hey, we're the Beerists. Beer geek friends who want to help you decide which beers are worth drinking and which ones you should chunk into the ocean. Every week, we try a different lineup, give you our recommendations, and talk a bunch of crap to each other, too. Because, hey, listening to a show about beer should be as fun as it is to drink it. So The Beerus is a super popular beer tasting podcast that records here in Austin. And over the course of six plus years and countless beers downed, the show has picked up a few podcast awards, amassed a huge audience, not to mention a huge number of Patreon supporters, and The Beerus continues to be one of, if not the most popular podcast about craft beer. It's definitely up there, and it's a lot of fun to listen to, and uh, it's also pretty lewd. It's a little lewd. Yeah, and it operates a lot with the hosts just kind of ribbing each other and being really uh, mean spirited, but in a in a friendly way. I mean, they they all love each other. And at the center of the podcast is John Rubio, who obviously does a lot more than drink beer in front of a microphone, because there is a ton of work that goes into envisioning and producing a top rated podcast. And John shares everything about creating the beers with us in this episode. Yeah, he goes into a lot of detail about the technical aspects of his process. And he's very obsessed with this. I mean, I've known Rubio for a long time, and when he goes into a project, he doesn't half-ass it. He gets really invested and is not going to put out a low-quality, substandard product. Yeah, he definitely whole-asses it. Whole-asses. <laughs> <laughs> so I was pretty excited to hear John tell us all about uh, how he turned to Beerus from just a simple idea into such a successful pod. Because his show and what he's done with it has really been a huge influence on me and the podcast that I produced. But Grant, you and John know each other. You've been buddies for a long time. Yeah, we started out podcasting uh, back in like 2008. So we've been podcasting together for like a decade. And, and you're you're on The Beerus. I'm on The Beerus. You're a co-host. Uh, yeah, we did The Beerus as a, a sort of a spinoff project that both of us could uh, work on after we were podcasting on some other shows previously. And this allowed him a lot more creative freedom to control the end product and make it exactly what he wanted it to be. And if you ever give it a listen, I think you will understand that he loves the product that he's putting out and he does a great job with it. Right. So it was great to get both of you in the studio and talk about the rise of the beerist. In this talk, John breaks it all down. He tells us everything about how he created the show, his philosophy for good podcast content, how he promotes the show, how he made the show such a huge success. So there's a ton of great tips and info in this interview for podcasters. And the thing that I love about John and his approach to podcasting is that he created the show with one goal in mind, make a show that I want to listen to. So he did. And that works out for him quite well. But let's let John tell it. So we started out by asking John about what inspired him to start the show. When we started our show, there weren't a lot of beer podcasts. And the ones that were out there that did what I wanted to do or did something similar to what I wanted to do weren't even fun to listen to. Everybody was really kind of boring and real technical and stuff. So... I wanted it to be a show that people who weren't even into the subject could get something out of. Sounds like you just wanted to fill a void that you wanted filled. Like you wanted to make the show you wanted to hear. That's that exactly right? right. Yeah. I couldn't find a show that fit my needs at all as a listener because I'm a big podcast freak. I listen to so many shows. Yeah. And there weren't any 
of the shows that I wanted to hear that were things that I was passionate about, you know? And yeah, sure, I could listen to This American Life, I could listen to Mark Marin, I could listen to all these other things, but for things that interested me, the subjects that I find myself most immersed in, I couldn't find a show that spoke to me in the way I wanted to be spoken to. Can you tell me a little bit about cultivating the audience that we have now? Like, what do you do to reach out to them to engage them beyond just putting a podcast out there? Well, I didn't want to do anything too weird when growing the show. I know lots of folks will look for guest spots on other shows or jump into forums and actively promote their show. And I did a little bit of that here and there, but I really just wanted to put myself out there. And if people showed up, they showed up. Right. And eventually they did. And those people posted about us on Reddit, and then more people showed up, and then we got nominated three years in a row for – actually four years in a row for podcast awards, and even more people showed up. And we got coverage in the newspaper here locally, and more people showed up. We got written up in magazines, and the Onion AV did a thing on us, and those all really are what got us our listener base. And it really didn't take very much from me because I didn't care if anybody listened. I wasn't doing it to be popular. You are making a show that you wanted to hear. Yeah. The first few weeks, we even forgot to plug in the equipment. <laughs> <laughs> not even, not even true. Really loudly so everybody could hear you. Yeah. Just yelling out of a window. Yeah. Podcasting a, to the neighbor. It's a live <laughs> podcast just for this neighborhood. Super exclusive. <laughs> no, but once in a while, you know, I would send beer to another podcast, another beer show, and they would mention us. And some people would check us out from that. Those spikes weren't ever that big. But, you know, people can do that and have various levels of success. Yeah, it sounds like you concentrate your effort on creating the good content. Yeah, just make the best show you can. Exactly. And I think a lot of people, maybe not a lot, but some focus on marketing subpar content. Well, because they want to be popular. Mm -hmm. I don't care about that. Yeah. You know, I just want to make something I'm proud of. You know, I, I've been an artist and a designer for a really long time. I draw. I've been doing. I've been drawing since I was a kid, and I didn't do that for anybody but me. Like those were just things I was making because the process of making it made me happy. And then once it was done, I could look at it and feel a sense of accomplishment. And this show is like that. You know, I, I feel gratified once I'm done. Not because other people are like, hey, that's a great show, but because I think it's a good show. That's it. So can we talk first about your the technical aspects of kind of improving the show, the equipment, the editing, the processing, the distribution? How did you learn about podcast recording and editing when like before you started the show? What was that process like? It was really trial and error. Yeah. I'd been on another podcast with Grant, and he... He and I were on this show that talked about like geek stuff, comic books and movies and video games and stuff. And we were just sort of on the show. I never really delved into any of the technicalities there. And I really didn't have any background in audio recording at all. So what I had to do before I felt comfortable recording my own show was to make sure it sounded decent, halfway decent, right? And to be fair, coming off of that show, you wouldn't have learned too much about like great quality audio. Anyway. Oh, I know. Yeah, it <laughs> was show real was a bad. Mess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that was another thing that was kind of tough for me is I couldn't ever recommend that show to anybody else because it sounded so bad, and I couldn't even listen to it because that's one of the things that usually makes me drop off of a show is if it was just annoying to listen to because of the technical deficiencies of the recording. Mm-hmm. So I wanted it to be somewhat decent to listen to. And I I go back to my first episodes and it sounds terrible to me. But eventually over time, I got to the point where now the show is starting to sound like we have a budget and a studio when it's just my guest room in my house. I built that whole thing out yeah. myself. And it was a lot of trial and error and just testing and retesting and fiddling with knobs and looking up, hey, what does a compressor do? Hey, what is a, how does a de-esser work? Right. You know, and then sort of nailing down that sort of uh, audio chain on the recording side and then figuring out everything that I have to do to post-process. 
So when you started the show or right before you started the show, did you – it sounds like you put a lot of work into it. And according to Grant, not only do you wrangle everybody together while you're on the mic and host the show. Of course, you do like maybe 12, 16 hours of editing for every episode. I do. So did you know that it was going to be this much work? And would you have done it if you knew it was that much work? Can I curse on this? Of course. Fuck no. (laughs) I didn't know. And no, I wouldn't have started it. That would have been one of the biggest ways, one of the biggest reasons that I wouldn't start it is I wanted this to be fun, Mm -hmm. you know? And the fact that it has taken me this amount of work is now just a fact of reality. Like if I want it to meet a certain standard, I need to put this work in which makes it easier for me to stomach the work, you know, but uh, I don't know. Like I, I'm trying to make things a little bit better, improve my efficiencies, and I'm slowly shaving a little bit of that time off at a time. So we are talking like 10 hours plus an episode, right? Oh, yeah. And you do weekly? Yes. Let's dig into that. Um, what are you looking for? What are you cleaning up in a typical episode of The Beerist? A lot of it is dead air. Some of it is ums, like filler words, right? People will say, um, uh, there'll be stuttering that happens when somebody will start a sentence and go, so, so I was, I was at the thing. I'll try to edit that too. So I was at that thing, right? So I will cut out. I do that all the time. I know. And it's bothersome. (laughs) (laughs) No, it's just something that I like to do. Like I want to maximize the time of the listener in that way. If I am listening to a show and five minutes is taken up by ums and uhs and stuttering, I'd rather have that time back. You know, I'd rather listen to something else in that five minutes. So personally, I want that stuff out of the show. Other things are we try to be funny and sometimes it doesn't work. I'll cut a joke out that doesn't go. I'll cut out subjects that don't ever go anywhere or resolve in any way. I'll cut out mouth sounds because we're drinking beer all the time. Mouths tend to make horrible sounds. Yeah, People I shouldn't will, be drinking coffee right now. I mean, you could. You just have to develop the technique. It's yeah. it's kind of difficult, but once you sort of apply yourself to doing that, you could figure out ways to do that and not make it make sounds. Uh Clinking glasses, swallowing, burping, coughing, all of those things are out of my recording. So what you get in the end is a really clean, hopefully well-produced show. It sounds like you edit the show with the idea that you're the end listener. Like you, you have that standard, your own standard. Like if I'm listening to it, this is the type of production that I want. And that's what you aim for. Yeah, I'm getting rid of all the things that bother me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's good. Let's we you alluded to it a little bit, but let's talk about editing while you're recording, which means dealing with your co-hosts and setting some boundaries for them, I guess. What do you do before a show? Is there like a is there and Grant, you can get into this, too. Is there a talk that happens before the show? Like, guys, remember these five rules or, hey, don't fucking say this or don't do that. How does that work? There is a great berating <laughs> every time. <laughs> well, should I be honest or should I be, be very honest? OK, yeah. well, it's it's tough. Because I have done a lot of that in the past, and I, I'm reluctant to do it now because it doesn't go over very well, as you can imagine, sometimes. Mm. Um, it, it tends to make people angry mm. when you tell them that they're doing something wrong. you know. And even though it's not wrong, per se, it's not the way they want to do it. And the way they want to do it is they just want to sit in front of a microphone and have a fun time. you know. But I'm interested in making a show. you know. I'm interested in putting something out there that I can be proud of. And anybody can have a conversation. Not everybody can make a show, you know? So these things are kind of at the front of my mind all the time. And I'm always listening to everybody talk so that if somebody says something wrong or starts a sentence out and it doesn't make sense, I'll actively stop them, rewind them and say, okay, start that sentence again. So you still do that. That's oh yeah. You yeah. still actively do. Yeah. Okay. Stop. Say that louder, you know, mm-hmm. things like that. Yeah. Um, or, You know, once in a while, at the beginning of a show, I'll say, hey, last week this happened a bunch. Everybody said the words a little bit seven times in three minutes. Let's not do that. Mm -hmm. You know, so I I try to keep those things out there. But, yeah, sometimes it gets difficult because people will just think you're being an asshole when really I just want to make a better show. Right. Yeah. Well, you alluded to when you first started hosting this 
maybe that process was a little rougher than it is now. Can you talk about how that's developed, how you communicate with your co-host to kind of not necessarily keep them in check, but make sure we're making a good show, but you don't alienate them to where when you start the show, they're pissed off at you? Well, luckily, after six years, it's not as required now as it has been. They're doing a really great job, I think. And once in a while, you know, I do have to step in and say something. But for the most part, there's a lot of self-policing that happens now. It's not quite as much as I'd like it to be, but it's a hell of a lot better than it was. Yeah, it used to be pretty sloppy. And, you know, for my part on the co-host end and receiving these notes each week, I know I stutter a lot. But I feel like I stutter a lot less now that I've become more cognizant of it because I have a a host like you who is constantly listening and editing and being able to note these problem areas that I can work on to improve. No, that's really nice to hear. And it's one of those things where it is a technique. You know, when you're speaking publicly or if you're speaking on the microphone, there are some things you can do to clean up your delivery. One thing is just to pause. You know, if you haven't crystallized your thought fully instead of doing the thing that we're all wanting to do and just fill that sound with vocalizations like, uh, don't do that. Just pause for a second, take a breath and let that thought come to you. And once it does, you can say it. It sounds natural. It sounds just as natural as anything else, but without that filler sound that can be grating to some. And by and large, Very few people care, but the ones that do, you're going to lose. And that's the problem, you know. If you can control for some of that loss, that makes your show all the better. Let's talk a little bit about comedy. (laughs) (laughs) Because your show, I mean, you have a, I guess you could describe it as a beer tasting show. Yeah. But it's really a comedy show. I I don't really drink a lot of beer. But I'll listen to your show. Oh, thank you. Uh, Somebody recommended it to me. I was like, that sounds like fun. I listened to it. I'm like, this is fucking hilarious. I'm going to listen. I'm never going to drink these beers, (laughs) probably. I'm gluten-free. But the show is really funny. I bet you have a lot of people who tell you that. Like, I don't drink, but I listen to your show. Yeah, I've heard that quite a few times. Mm -hmm. It's really gratifying. Yeah. So as he does, Shane Barnett sent us a box of beer. We do have to mention it because he included a special gift wrapped thing. And when I took it out of the box, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to wait to open this with the group, you know, with the team, because it's not just for me. There's something special about it. Did he write a note with it or anything? There was no note. I had no idea about what that was going to be. Well, we took a video. (laughs) Yeah, we took a video. I actually handed it to Mike so he could open it on the video. And we're all expecting something kind of cool. Little did we know Mm. that it was a... Clone a Willy. Yeah, clone a Willy. That's what it was. Oh, man. It's a tube that allows a man to make a clone mold of his dick. I'm doing it. I know you're doing it. Yeah, no one else was volunteering, dude. No. So Mike no actually, competition here. he jumped on that grenade and started fucking it. Yeah. <laughs> so do you have any rules or guidelines for what works and what doesn't work in terms of comedy on your show? Yes. I actually wrote a document <laughs> about that. Do you remember that, Grant? I do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do you think about that document, Grant? Well, I, I read through it. I, I don't recall all of the details of it, but you should I should reread it. <laughs> <laughs> I I found that it was at least insightful into your methodology for how you want to construct the show and how you want jokes to play out and how you want us to interact with each other on the mic. Well, what what influenced that? Like what made you sit down and do- and dedicate the time to writing a document of This is, we're going to be funny, but it has to fall within these boundaries. It's just what I find funny, really. I'm my own worst critic. I will rail myself hard if something isn't right. And one of the things that I wanted to make sure of is that I I could laugh at my own show. 
I hear so many podcasts out there that claim to be funny or are supposed to be funny or just shows in general where it's the same easy damn joke every single time. And anytime a subject comes up, the same four or five easy jokes come out about that subject. And then everybody on the microphone has a, a chance to get their own little thing in. And it's just, oh, come on, like just move on, say something funny and just move on, you know? And if it doesn't work out that way, it it just feels hacky, you know? So if something comes up on the show, if there's a subject that comes up and it's happened before, I don't want somebody to say the exact same thing that they thought was funny last time that maybe hit and maybe it got a really big laugh. Say something different about that thing. Like challenge yourself to make it funny again. Right. You know, don't just. Give us the exact same thing you just gave us. One of our other hosts, Mike, has a really hard time with that sometimes where he will say something that he thought was funny 10 minutes ago and make the exact same joke 10 minutes later and laugh his own ass off. He'll say the same joke verbatim like like a week later and you're like, you said that exact whole like paragraph. Before. And at that point, it's not funny because a lot of humor is with the surprise. You know, a lot of the the thing that makes you laugh is the surprise of how clever the thing you said is. And if I'm not surprised anymore, it's not going to make me laugh. I, I think we also like heavily avoid falling into the trap of of catchphrases I think it was great for you to illustrate to us in that document, uh, the the anti joke document. I know it, it sounds so <laughs> fucking crazy whenever I hear it. So like it's unfunny. a document about funny. <laughs> but you did mention like if we are going to make quips about like some uh some some joke is made and people are going to go around the room, you put an actual n- number limit on the number of times that's going to be accepted, and then we have to stop. Yeah, like if, as for an example, if we see a beer can and it's got something funny on it, like let's say it's a squirrel and somebody goes, hey, I'm going to go hide those nuts. And then somebody else, and and that's so dumb. Like that's just not (laughs) even funny. But it's just an example, right? And the next person goes, haha, they're just squirreling it away. And then the next person says, yeah, squirrels, what are they good for? And then another person says something about squirrels. Like stop, Mm -hmm. stop at the first one. Right. Move on, yeah. you know. Uh, now you're just beating a horse. It sounds like everything you're telling me in terms of creating the content for your show, creating the boundaries for what happens on the mic. Um, you had a maybe not super clear vision, but a pretty well. Yeah, it was. It seems like a pretty clear vision. You think that's something that's really important to start with? And how much room do you think there is for? experimentation, letting things happen when you're starting a podcast? Well, I think I had a loose idea more than a clear vision. I think that vision starts to crystallize over time and things that work, I'll encourage and things that don't work, I don't, you know, it's kind of difficult because for as much as I want to say, Hey, yeah, this was all my idea. It really wasn't. I thought it was important that everybody else also brought something to the table. And I think like, for an example, the reason Grant and I work so well is because there are a lot of things that Grant says that I don't find funny, but people who are listening will think how I react to the stuff he says is hilarious. And that's way better than anything I can do or that he can do on our own. I think in part what you're referring to there and what if we can jump back to when you were talking about when you give us criticism before an episode, Mm -hmm. why sometimes you meet with a little bit of resistance. I think when I'm getting notes on technical details, it's a lot easier to absorb and know how to um, work on self-improvement in that area. But with something like humor, it's a lot more subjective. And do you, have when, a, do you have a couch you can lay down on right now? It's right behind you. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, but I, I think sometimes I will. I, I wouldn't say I, n- always I get angry. I, I don't generally get too angry about it, but I, I might push back on the boundaries of what I might consider a little bit more funny than you. Sure. And ultimately, you are the the end judge because you're the one editing and creating the show. So this is something that has to fit into your mold of what is humor. And and it's difficult to necessarily fully tailor to that all the time. But I also think it's important to have that conversation. Yeah. yeah. You know, because sometimes something you do will work that I didn't think I'd like. No, that's what I, I agree with. I think that 
even if sometimes it can be aggravating to your co-hosts for you to tell them like, hey, you stop doing this or, or adjust it. I think that's a learning lesson to me on ways that I could still try and improve however my on-air personality is coming across to better serve the end audience. Yeah, and not only that, but as a designer myself, and you're a graphic designer as well, I work so much better when there are limits, you know, when there are boundaries that I'm supposed to stay within. It helps me be creative. And I think that helps other people be creative also, whether they realize it or not. Right. So I try to put some sorts of boundaries up in hopes that those limits will actually provoke people to think around corners a little bit more. Right. (laughs) Those values like discipline, like pushing yourself past what's comfortable for you, like making sure everything is on a schedule, making sure everything is, is sort of laid out so all you have to do is be creative within these boundaries. That makes everything so much easier to make and to be dynamic and to make something that's satisfying and quality. Does that make sense? It it does. I, I relate to that a lot. I like find that I'm the most creative when I have strict boundaries. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. It allows you to focus. Yeah. Well, if somebody, it's your framework. If somebody says, here's a piece of paper, draw whatever you want. Mm-hmm. Oh, shit. <laughs> like, what am I going to put in there? Yeah. If somebody says, here's a piece of paper, I need you to draw something with this stick. You're only going to use this stick. And it can only be about something that happened to you today. And make it good. And make it good. Make it interesting to me. That's so much more fun to do. Because it's going to make you think about everything that you're going to put down on that paper. It's going to push you out of your comfort zone. And sometimes that results in something great. Oftentimes it results in something even better than what you would do if you just fell on something you were comfortable in. Right. Grant, maybe you can speak a little because part of being a host and starting a show and producing a show is picking your co-host. And there's a lot that goes into that. We've talked about the chemistry that you have with Grant. You know, maybe you don't find something funny that he says, but your reaction makes for great podcasting uh, and the audience enjoys it. Oh, it's not just my reaction. It's his reaction to my reaction right. also. Yeah. Everything about it is gold. Right. Like, I, I love everything about it. The end result is something I laugh at, even though I didn't laugh at the thing he said. Right, yeah. And it's hilarious. Like, yeah. it ends up being really, really funny. Yeah, you, you, like, take a step out of of yourself and listen to it, and it's funny. No, 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 it's not just that. Yeah. I listen to it as myself, <laughs> and the interaction makes me crack up. Right. Even though I was in it, you right. know, and yeah. I was not liking it at the time. Well, that's one consideration. The uh, how 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 am I going to play with this person on the mic, and is it going to be funny? Right. Is it going to be entertaining? That's one huge consideration when picking a co-host. What else are you looking for when you're looking for a co-host? Somebody who can speak. Yeah, that's helpful. That would be good. No mutes here. No, no. <laughs> no. Some people have a hard time articulating their thoughts, and in an audio show, that's kind of everything, isn't it? Mm-hmm. So you really want to try to find somebody who can actually do that. That's sort of bottom level step one. Step two is somebody who's dependable. You don't want to have somebody be your co-host and then bow out two weeks in. When we first started the show. (laughs) That did happen. (laughs) Yeah. When we first started the show, I picked four people and one of them never came back after the first recording. How'd you handle that? Got somebody else. Just right away slotted somebody else in. They didn't work either. Mm. And then got a third person and he stuck around. Mm -hmm. Man, but from episode three, six years later, everyone stuck around. And for the most part, we all try to show up every single week for this. Yeah. So what compels you, Grant, to show up every single week for six years? Free beer. Right. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, of the different shows I've done, I... May give Rubio a hard time for stuff, and we we generally have a, an adversarial relationship. What's on really? Imp- I just want to point out, he said "may" in that sentence. <laughs> Not "may" give me a hard time. I, I definitely give you a hard time yeah. all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I genuinely find that this is one of the best shows that I've been on. I learn from it. I have a great time with everyone else every week. 
And, you know, it's it's already going to be very communal in nature just because we're sharing beers with friends. But the fact that we also are all collaborating on a project, we're, we're putting this onto a record, we are making a, a weekly podcast that goes out to other people and we get to engage with them as well. It's just a very enriching and rewarding project. And not only that, but Rubio spends so much time and effort in editing and producing this to make a like genuinely quality product. It's a badge of pride to be associated with it. Oh, that's real nice. Thank it you. It sounds like you sh- you're saying you respect the man. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do. I, like, I love this guy. You know, there can, there can be levels to respect. Sure. You know, you can respect some things and not others. He respects respects you in this certain sense area. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, but I, I just, I have a lot of fun hanging out with these guys. You know, Grant, Mike, and Anastasia are all so much fun and so different, you know, and everybody's got this really cool little spirit of competition. People are kind of trying to one up each other and in fun ways. And it's never mean, you know, it's mean, but there's love behind it. You know, it's like family. It is. Mm -hmm. It is in my family in particular, they're all assholes, (laughs) but there's something really nurturing about the whole thing that I love. You know, I'm kind of addicted to that. It's always remarkable to me, and I'm sure I've mentioned this plenty of other times elsewhere, but the fact that we do a weekly podcast, that gets us pretty drunk by the end of the episode. And in the course of six years, the arguments that have been had are like a handful. Yeah. And even then, none of them have been so bad that like people didn't show up the next week. <laughs> I can only really remember like four, maybe. It's more than I can. <laughs> yeah. Is that the biggest challenge? Uh, well, what are the biggest challenges of drinking and getting progressively more drunk? The fist fights. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. There haven't been any fist fights. Well, on the mic, you're drinking, and then you're several beers in towards the end. So does that make it hard? Yeah. Well, I mean, aside from being a host of the show, I'm also actively trying to direct it sometimes. Right. And keeping all of that in the front of my mind gets difficult when you throw a bunch of alcohol on it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can't even do that while sober <laughs> you, only need, you, you don't need all your kidneys right uh, you need one really but well i hope i still have one good to have both given the amount of drinking we do it's ideal that you have at least three yeah we <laughs> hope they invent an off-board kidney or just a portable dialysis machine we, we need an extra liver i, I need another liver i think sky mall sells those <laughs> <laughs> let's go through your audio chain what from the mic to the cables to the um, the interface to okay. the software, what are you doing? Well, I'm using these microphones, Shure SM7Bs. I really love them. Me too. They have a great sound, and I have them mounted to the table on a couple of road boom arms. And the cables they go through are just kind of bargain bin, just everyday shielded cables going into cloud lifters and then into some DBX 286Ss. So each mic goes into one of those boxes. It's an amp. And it's a pretty cheap amp. It's it's relatively reasonable. I think about 260 bucks each. So you have the mics going into a cloud lifter and they each have an amp? Yeah. Okay. These things take a lot of gain. They if do. You re- if you want to yeah. get a really good, clean signal, yeah. they take a lot of gain. A cloud lifter wasn't enough hmm. because my mixer, the preamps weren't strong enough even with the cloud lifter. I didn't want to – I didn't want to – push them that hard because you introduce a lot of a lot of hiss into it a lot of just really crappy sound in the background and adding the cloud lifter and these other amplifiers really helped out with that and those go into another behringer processing unit that has a deesser it's got a compressor it's got a hard limiter and a couple of like vocal enhancers and i use a little bit of each of those things just to polish it up before it goes into my mixer and that goes into my computer I'm recording an Adobe Audition, and then I'm also doing a backup recording into my Zoom H6. Okay. Kind of similar to what we have here. You have a few extra pieces there. Mm-hmm. Um, it sounds like you're an advocate of the hardware. Yes. I do a lot of post-production work in software, like the DSer, things like that. Why are, why are you an advocate of more of, do, of getting rid of that stuff up front in the hardware? It's just because it's up front? That's a... One less button I have to click, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. So the more I can 
have it done before it ever gets committed to disk, the better. I feel like it's just another point of hardware, potential hardware failure. It's just an anxiety that I have. If I'm plugging into too many things, there's too many things that can go wrong. Sure. I haven't had that happen yet. Good. And again, I'm still learning. Yeah. So once that does happen, I'll panic accordingly. <laughs> <laughs> but so once everything gets recorded, I will throw it into a phonic leveler. Leveler? Is it leveler or levelator? Well, there's Levelator two th- is a different brand. Okay. Yeah. So I'll- yeah, a phonic leveler and process it through there at, I think, 18 luffs. I believe from there I put it into RX of uh, uh, what is it? RX something. RX six or yeah, it was, I, it was one of have, those. We have that. Yeah. Yeah. I'll put it into there and I, I run a couple of processes in there to get rid of some clicks, get rid of some mouth sounds and do an EQ, you know, do a hard shelf at the top and the bottom. And from there I put it into Adobe audition and I do my edit. Okay. So lots of processing up front before the actual cutting happens. Yeah. Okay, cool. And it might not be the best way to do it. I don't know. Yeah. I'm doing this by the seat of my pants. Right. This is just the way that I learned to do it without any input. So what was your learning experience like? Was there a YouTube channel? Was there a book? Was there another podcast you listened to that helped you figure out your production chain? It was a mishmash of YouTube and articles online and... Some forum stuff, you know, asking questions on Reddit. Was there like a specific source that was like, oh, this is the place? I couldn't name one. No? No. Yeah. No, there was everywhere. That's how things work now. I know. You just gather from where you can. And it's not even, it's it's difficult because it'll be, okay, how does this Sure SM7B going through a cloud lifter affect this other thing? Right. You know, so you have to have people with the experience of all three of those things to answer your question. And maybe they can't. Right. Uh, you provide some, maybe a lot of supplemental content in the form of, uh, Patreon incentives. Oh yeah. Episodes, merchandising, you do video pre-shows thanks to this guy over here. We've actually stopped doing the video pre-shows. Oh yeah. Yeah. Not a lot of people watched it. Really? It it took up a big chunk of time that I'd rather use making other things with. So the ROI just wasn't there. Yeah. And eventually maybe we'll figure out a way to make that better. Maybe schedule it, do a little bit more promotion so that more people could show up and actually make it worth our time. And it it's, I don't mean worth by, Hey, if we do this, we're not making money because we don't make a lot of money at all. I just want to put my energy behind something that is going to be watched by more people. Well, you do do other supplemental content that people can get on Patreon. Can you talk about the decision to do that? What the goals were there and have you reached those goals? Are you getting there? Well, the thing about the show is that I don't like, so again, getting back to the fact that I'm making the show that I wanted to listen to, I don't like ads on my podcast. I skip them all. I don't want to hear a thing about stamps again. I don't want to hear a thing about mattresses again or underwear or shave things, right? I don't care. Boxes of junk. I don't give a shit, right? So I skip all that stuff. I wish I didn't have to skip that. So for my show, I don't want that in there. Like I'm just not going to put ads in there because I can't stand to listen to them. But what I do do is I ask our listeners to support us, right? I ask our listeners, hey, if you if you love this show, kick a couple of bucks over, you know, four bucks a month, five bucks a month, whatever you can afford. That's going to help us out immensely, right? So I was doing that through PayPal at first. And PayPal at the time was the best way I could think of to do it. Eventually, Grant actually told me about Patreon. And it took me a long time to actually – Pull the trigger on that. It takes me a long time to do anything. I like to think things through before I go whole hog into something. Hell, when we decided to do this podcast, it took me like seven months before I said, yeah, let's do it, to actually starting to do it because I had a feel like I could. You know, but that sort of goes through everything I do. I want to make sure that, hey, if I'm going to dedicate this amount of time to something, I want it to be something that I'm proud of. So when we pulled the trigger on Patreon, I wanted to make sure that people were getting something for their support. So I'm 
making these things mini versions of our episodes where we'll review one or two beers at a time and release them to our patrons. And eventually I ended up putting in other rewards like, hey, here's a glass or here's some stickers for the higher tiers. And people seem to be responding to it pretty well. We don't make a lot of money at all, but I'm not in this to make money. You know, I'm in this to make something I enjoy. So for the independent podcaster like yourself, yeah, do you think it's a better target for them to do the listener supported model than to try and somehow rack up enough downloads to attract an advertiser? It's sort of weird because if you have a rabid enough fan base, you don't need a whole lot of listeners to break even. And really, only consider that you're going to break even, right? That's what most shows that are successful do. They break even. They don't make money. Don't do this to make money. If you if you want to make some money, don't go into podcasting. Do it because you want to talk about things you like. Do it because you want to entertain people. Do it because there are people out there that might think what you have to say is interesting. It doesn't take a whole lot of people to break even. User supported. It takes a whole lot more listeners to break even to put ads in there. And that's going to mean that you might sell things that you don't even believe in, that you don't care about. That's going to put 30 seconds to two minutes worth of things into your show that might not need to be there. Some people, after a certain threshold of listeners, get a whole lot out of ads. I bet you those people will get more out of a listener-supported model. So we've talked a lot about some of the successes of the show, how it's grown, how it's won awards. What are some of the aspects of the show that you feel were failures, things that you tried that just didn't work out, and how do you take and learn from that and move on? Yeah, we did a show at a bar here in town, and unfortunately it was a bar that was open to the public also, and anybody could show up, including people who didn't really care that we were doing a live show. So that didn't work too well. <laughs> it turned out pretty awkward, yeah. 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 And a lot of us trying to maintain a show while having to deal with engaging that direct audience made the end result unlistenable to our general audience. Yeah, I never released it on the feed because it was just a cluster. Yeah. You mentioned at the beginning some of your podcasts uh, or some podcasts that you do listen to, but I know that you listen to a ton of podcasts. Oh, yeah. Which ones do you find actually are the most influential and which ones do you just – maybe not just influential, but also ones that you just love right now? Well, as far as influential, I'm not really influenced by a lot of podcasts. I'm influenced by how some of them sound – Right. I think some of them have better sound than others. NPR shows tend to have really good sound, but those aren't the types of shows I want to make. No, but, but the shows that I am really influenced by are things like Top Gear, like I said, right. things that sort of break the mold of the traditional show, like cooking shows that aren't Julia Child. Even though Julia Child was a trendsetter in her day, eventually everybody just mimicked her. And then along comes Gordon Ramsay, and make something really cool and different, you know? And you can watch that show, you can watch Top Gear without giving a shit about cars. Those things are really fun to me. And if they make the subject fun, that might capture the imagination of some people that haven't necessarily thought about that yet. So given, once again, that you listen to a lot of other podcasts, um, the podcast industry is clearly growing a lot more. A lot of people are are suddenly realizing how accessible it is that they can kind of uh, jump in and do what they were doing with blogs, I guess, earlier. 
Where do you think, uh, and this is a little bit more of a, a futurist question for you, uh, where do you think it's going? Like, do you have any uh, thoughts on where you think the podcast industry might be changing and how that might affect our show? Well, it's interesting because it seems like podcasting first started as a bunch of nerds who wanted to make audio content. And it, it still, by and large, is that. Right. And people just wanted to make, oh, I want to make a Harry Potter show where we talk about Harry Potter. I want to make a thing where we talk about Firefly or or something, right? It was all these people who just wanted to make shows and put them out there for other nerds and geeks who wanted to listen to it. Now it's turning more into radio on demand and these really well-produced shows on demand. And I think it's going to continue going in that direction. I like all of it. You know, there's some shows that I listen to that are like shoestring, a couple of guys recording on their phone. Sounds terrible. But the stuff is so compelling. Like the, the points of views, the perspectives they provide are so compelling to me that I can't stop listening to it. I think there's room for everybody, really. But we're going to keep seeing more of these big companies and entertainment companies dip their toe into podcasts and sometimes make good stuff, sometimes make shitty shows. And recently we've seen some companies start up these podcasting networks where you pay like seven bucks and you, you get access to all of their shows that don't have a free version of those shows. And I think that's fine too. I mean, there's some quality content on, on those types of networks also. I mean, I think there's, like I said, a listener for each one of these things that are out there and why not? I find it fascinating how some of the bigger guys that have come into the game you think of like uh i mean this american life has been going for a long time but oh like, espn has shows yeah but like uh serial coming in and um and s town mm -hmm. and how they've elevated the art of this and inspired other people who are still doing their really indie funded projects to be able to try and think outside of what they thought a podcast could be and come up with new experimentation for it. I mean, oh, yeah. I just saw that Marvel is now, I mean, this is a while ago, but Marvel's doing like, oh, we're now going to have Wolverine do his own podcast. Like it's <laughs> like a novel thing. I'm like, hey, everybody, it's Wolverine again. <laughs> it's not that novel, but so, uh, uh, it's, well, I'm a, it's Marvel. What's going on in Canada? Yeah, I tried the new uh, Burger King chicken fries today <laughs> and, uh, you know, they're not bad, but uh, I feel my healing factor kick in every time I eat one. <laughs> <laughs> Wolverine doing a podcast. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Remember how I said there's room for everybody? <laughs> Except for them. No, no. Not, no. not the X-Men. I don't want to hear Wolverine's podcast. I, I kind of do now, though. <laughs> it won't be as good as him reviewing, reviewing BK Fries. I'll, I'll hate listen to it. I'll anger listen to that one. I think that one's behind a paywall, so you have to pay money to do that. Yeah, fuck that then. Yeah, no, yeah. I'll hate problem. it from afar. There you go. Okay, thanks for listening. You can find us at createpodatx.com. Find John's show at, at The Beerist. Uh, the Beerist? com. Beerist.com. Grant, who do we have on our next show in a couple weeks? Uh, next, we're going to be interviewing Corey Coleman of doubletoasted.com, and he's going to be talking to us about cultivating a an audience, and he a has huge, done yeah. a fantastic job of that. A huge passionate audience so we talked to Corey all about that and kind of go into the origins of his show and his podcast and youtube empire and here's a clip from that episode what was it that inspired you to say i want to go on tv i want to express my opinions i want to start a show well like i tell everybody uh it was never the intention to be on tv it was just to get some free stuff and go <laughs> and go see movies for free right we figured that i used to work with a guy that used to go see movies as much as I did and we would go we started going to see movies together and we realized we weren't making that much money and we had to find an angle to see as many movies as we wanted without paying for them and uh we so he said we should do a radio show or an access television show so we went and took our classes and I was uh, an illustrator over at the Austin American Statesman the paper here in town so I had access to go into the news area. 
So once we took our classes and got certified to make a show, we just had to make the contacts to produce one show to prove to the 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 studios that we could we would actually produce something. Mm-hmm. And uh, the critic at the time, I just broke into their Rolodex and just stole a bunch of addresses, and and then we we got our uh, our first movie to to go and go see as press, and we did one show, and I thought, you know what, this this isn't as hard as I thought it would be. So it, we we just kept doing it. And yeah, once again, be sure to check out that interview with Corey. It was a lot of fun, and it'll be dropping in a few weeks. Make sure to subscribe to the podcast at createpodatx.com. Follow us on Twitter at createpodatx. We love you. We love you.